Greetings. My name is Amareshwar Galla, Professor of Inclusive Cultural Leadership and Director of International Center for Inclusive Cultural Leadership at Anant National University in Ahmedabad World Heritage City in India. I'm honored and delighted to be invited to speak on International Museum Day, 18th May 2020 by the Indian Museum, Calcutta. I've had several opportunities to speak at the Indian Museum, both keynote speeches as well as centenary, bicentenary spe speeches. However, this is the first time that I'm uh, giving an address uh, in the digital domain, which is the way we are all being connected in this pandemic situation, far more than you know, people ever anticipated. Uh, people just didn't realize how much they could connect in the digital domain. But we are connecting through a range of platforms. What will happen in the post-pandemic situation? Uh, we will have a blended situation where we will use the digital domain like the way we're using now. Plus, we'll use uh, the real or face-to-face -face situations on-site tactile, you know, approaches to objects in museums. Uh, so the diversity of opportunities for us to engage in museums has been enhanced considerably. So that's one way to look at it positively. However, please do take care. It's going to be a long time before we get back to whatever people call the new normal. Uh, my fundamental question is, who determines that new normal? Because what was considered in the uh, considered normal in the previously is not exactly for everybody. It was for urban elites mostly, uh, highly e educated people, and um, and children and others who went to museums as part of the recreational spectrum, but not necessarily in control of the discourse of museology. So the new normal should really be in a situation that is inclusive, which is the focus of the International Museum Day. And inclusive in a museum like the Indian Museum means many things. Well, what makes the Indian Museum Indian? Uh, in fact, it's the largest and the oldest museum in the Indian subcontinent. It has collections from all over South Asia and beyond. How does one look at multiple stories, multiple narratives connecting these collections and their source communities. Often source communities is misunderstood in terms of only European collections and where they came from, from the former colonies. It's far, far more than that. It's within the countries themselves too. Where do the collections originate from? What kind of methodologies do we have? The second word that is uh, emphasized uh, in the theme of the International Museum Day uh, is uh, uh, di diversity. Now, a country like India, like many countries, has been historically, culturally, socially, and in many other ways diverse. But it's the first country which has a constitution that was adopted on 26th of January 1950, which very clearly outlined the fundamental rights and privileges of its citizens irrespective of their race, ethnicity, gender, caste, economic status, all those cultural borders that we often forget when we talk about inclusion. Because often in inclusion we tend to think in terms of the deficit model, us and them, us who have access to museums, them who don't have access, we are providing access. It's a master narrative from those that are empowered. And in many ways, it's very paternalistic. But in the new normal, whatever that is, uh, there needs to be a collaborative approach in the way we manage the museological discourse. We manage the multiple stories, interpretations uh, that museums provide as sites, as civic spaces for presenting our sense of place and identity 
as individuals, as groups, as communities, as people of wearing many different hats. Like I, for one, uh, I come from Amaravati in Andhra Pradesh, hence my name is Amareshwar. I was born there. I grew up speaking Telugu. I learned Hindi and I learned Sanskrit. But now I'm speaking in English. But I'm an Australian citizen. But I'm also an overseas citizen of India. And I've lived in Denmark. I lived in South Africa. So I have multiple identities, multiple perspectives which intersect as I negotiate my own sense of place and identity. So in a culturally and linguistically diverse country like India, which is probably one of the most diverse in the world, the only other country that's more diverse uh, linguistically is Papua New Guinea. So in a country like India, what does it mean? And where is the museum cited when we talk about inclusion? The third word that is used in the theme of the International Museum Day is equality. Equality is an aspiration. Equity is an outcome. So if it is aspirational, what kinds of policy frameworks, uh, what kinds of legal mechanisms, what kind of resources are there for us to make museums more equitable in terms of an outcome and uh, promote equality as an aspiration for everyone as active citizens irrespective of their background. So these are the kinds of questions that I want to pose to you right at the beginning. And uh, what, I, what I want to say is that uh, this approach to inclusion, uh, equality, uh, diversity, it's nothing new in ICOM. Uh, when ICOM was formed uh, immediately after the Second World War, at the same time, as uh, UNESCO, in fact, it's an accredited professional body of UNESCO. Uh, it, it it was already, you know, engaged in exchanges uh, with a range of cultures and countries, which are very diverse and different. And uh, in 1992, when ICOM General Conference took place in Quebec City in Canada, one of the recommendations. It was to establish a working group on cross-cultural issues. I was privileged as an Australian uh, to, uh, to be invited to chair that. And uh, we subsequently conducted a range of uh, consultations uh, without any specific budget, and uh, which means that we worked in partnerships with various countries, various committees, various museums from different parts of the world. And we came up with a whole framework uh, for, a, uh, for policy development of ICOM. Then it was decided uh, in uh, uh, 2004, uh, when ICOM met for its Triennial General Conference in Korea, to transform the working group into a cross-cultural task force, to actually come up with a very specific framework uh, that would enable people to benchmark the extent to which they are becoming more inclusive, if you will. Uh, it, it's a very dynamic process, it's becoming. And uh, so that led to a range of advocacies, including the inclusion of intangible heritage in the definition of a museum in 2007 in the Triennial General Conference in Vienna. Because once you start talking about inclusion and cultural diversity, it's more than the tangible, the intangible. You have to reanimate the object. You have to safeguard all forms of living heritage to bring it into a holistic perspective uh, without just being object-centered, but inclusive in a way that you bring together the object-centeredness and the community-centeredness into a holistic discourse. In the way you bring together the contextuality and the coloniality and the post-coloniality of the object into a holistic discourse. The way you bring together the museum and the historical cultural landscape within which it's located, you bring them together. So through a range of processes, through a consultative mechanism, through the various constituent committees, both national, international, and working groups of ICOM, uh, we drafted and presented the ICOM Cultural Diversity Charter. 
in November 2010 in Shanghai. It is called ICOM Cultural Diversity Charter. You can Google it. It's on the ICOM webpage. It's uh, on the Inclusive Museum webpage. If you go to onmuseums.com or if you go to inclusivemuseums.org, both in both the cases, museums is plural, you'll be able to download not only uh, the Cultural Diversity Charter, but its context, uh, who are the range of people from across the world, from diverse backgrounds that worked on it. Now, it's still a project without an end. We've, that was 10 years ago, Shanghai meeting. We've come a long way, but we still got a long way to go. And, uh, and for the last five years, I've been living after 43 years in Australia, Denmark, and South Africa. I've, been, I've moved back to India. And in these five years, I go back to that very fundamental question that I asked during my first ICOM Triennial General Conference in 1989 in Den Haag in the Netherlands. Dr. Saroj Ghosh, the first ever Asian to become a president of the International Council of Museums, uh, a stalwart in the field of museums who was the founding director general of the National Council of Science Museums of India. He was in Dunhag in 1989 with uh, a cohort of some 30 museum directors and uh, from, from all over India. So I introduced myself for the first time and uh, he introduced me very generously, very kindly. He's a very compassionate man, always helpful to a number of the Indian colleagues. Then I had a question. I asked him, how do Indian museums deal with the heritage of indigenous people, what we call in India tribal, scheduled tribes, uh, or aboriginal, adivasi? Uh, and he, his crew or his colleagues said that, oh, there's Indira Gandhi, Rashtri, Mano Sangrali, and Bhopal, and we have collections in the Indian Museum, we have collections in different museums. My question was, because at that time, I was the National Director of Affirmative Action for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the capacity building in Canberra for the whole country. My question was, could we have some cultural exchanges with indigenous employees in the museums? And there was stone silence. Nobody was able to answer whether there were Adivasis, employed as conservators, collections managers, of course curators is a more new term these days, and uh, working as managers, working in museums. And uh, so for Dr. Saroj Ghosh turned around to everybody and said, it's a very important question, very interesting question, but we have to address it. He was very emphatic. So since then, he, be, he has become a mentor for me in the way we have traveled this journey to reach a situation where for the first time uh, we have inclusion as a main focus for the International Museum Day. We had cultural diversity in 2004, but this is the first time we're talking very emphatically about inclusion equality and diversity. Uh, having said that, I, I want to uh, say that what the lockdown has done, what the pandemic has done is it's thrown us off balance. Nobody knew, nobody knew that we would encounter a situation where museums would close, uh, about social distancing, and, uh, and even more poignantly, that so many people would lose jobs because there's a whole range of people in the informal sector. Like if you take India, for instance, nearly 80% of the people working in the tourism sector are employed in the informal sector. So most of them have no income for the last two months and they've been struggling. A lot of them provide uh, you know, services for museums and their constituencies in India within the broader context of heritage tourism. So what happens with the uh, revitalization of the economy? Uh, we all hear economies saying it's going to take a year, it's going to take two years, uh, we will never be back to the same situation. 
that's all fine if you come from a middle class background you have access to various things do we have a resilience fund uh, uh, do do we have a job keeper uh, fund job keeper approach i mean i think these are the things that as museum professionals we need to advocate unfortunately in india we don't have a strong tradition or strong museum professional body approach that has uh, enough cloud to advocate and inform the government's approach so the government in the absence of such advocacy makes decisions in the best possible way it does so i think that you know museum professionals in the country either individually or collectively through their institutions they should advocate that the government establish a job keeper fund that is for people not to lose their jobs people who have been dismissed for them to come back especially those that are the public face for us you know like museum educators museum interpreters museum guides these are the people these are the storytellers these are the people who communicate the heritage values that are embedded in our museum collections and uh, but we need them uh, that they are quintessential for us to talk about inclusion equality and diversity if we want to talk about it Uh, who are the mediators for us between uh, collections and the people? Because a collection, an object, uh, there is an old Muslim saying in Taj Ganj, near the Taj Mahal, and I, I will never forget hearing this. A closed book is like a block of stone. So an object, you know, unless we understand its intrinsic and extrinsic values, an object, unless it's interpreted, it's contextualized, an object with together with the collection becomes part of a journey becomes part of a story uh, it is like a closed book it's it's like a block of stone but the people the educators the guides the interpreters uh, all these people they, they are the ones who reanimate our collections so how do we bring them back how do we protect their jobs i think that's something that we have to think about uh, a kind of what in australia we call job keeper program so that the government makes a, a temporary intervention to rehabilitate people in their jobs so that they can keep them so our museums can function the second thing is that we we've, we've run i mean in fact uh, after the gujarat earthquake i raised the funds and brought together people from uh, 69 countries who were involved in emergencies to hyderabad under the umbrella of international council of museums and uh, together with getty Cons conservation institute and international uh, center for conservation and restoration in rome ikram uh, we kick started a museum emergency program but when we started that it was very much to do with earthquakes i mean it's evolved considerably now there's major bodies addressing disaster preparedness but this at that time we were mainly dealing with earthquakes uh, tsunamis and all kinds of natural and man-made disasters i use the word man very deliberately including war like at that time the iraq war is something that you know we were addressing and we brought we flew in somebody uh, from ba baghdad to be part of a conference in hyderabad but now this is a different kind of the pandemic is a different kind of disaster if you will but we were never prepared for it nobody ever trained anybody for it we didn't anticipate it in fact you know people always look at london paris new york when an issue comes up in museums they like to go there and train hey paris london new york they have no answers they have no answers for us in museums you know how to deal with this pandemic they themselves are struggling even just to protect their people and uh, so in a country like india we need to be creative and innovative to come up with contextual localized with national policy approach as to how we deal with disasters of this kind disasters of this kind are not new for us uh, you take the indian museum for instance the indian museum is a witness to several famines floods it's a witness you know to the water manipulation by the colonial administrators that led to massive outbreaks of malaria so many people died in bengal and uh, 
And then the, one of the most recent, one of the biggest famines in India uh, was in Bengal. Uh, the undivided India was in Bengal uh, in the mid 40s. Plenty of food, plenty of food crops, but they're being exported uh, by the British elsewhere. Over three and a half million people died. So we have, we have these experiences during the very time of the Indian Museum. But the thing is that in India, like in Australia, like any other country that I've worked in, we do suffer from cultural amnesia. We forget. We talk about memory, but we often forget what is it that we've experienced historically? What is it that we have been doing in museums? Uh, can we learn from our past experiences? This amnesia is really you know, stifling us because we're not progressing. So what we got to do is we got to learn, we got to understand from past experiences. Uh, in fact, when I gave the uh, bicentenary lecture at the Indian Museum a few years ago, I basically said my dream would be to see an exhibition of the historical realities, including the stories, the material culture, the interpretation of a range of things that are there from the Bengal famine of mid-1940s. Uh, why? Because in Australia, I've seen so much, uh, uh, you know, about 1842, the spot, the potato famine of Ireland, uh, which led to so many Irish people emigrating, leaving elsewhere. And uh, the way the potato famine from 1842, you know, has become part of the foundational story, if you will, of so many Australian stories is very important. And of course, you can go back to Ireland and you would get very poignant stories. So 100 years later was the Bengal famine. So where are the stories in our museums? Like there are stories in Australia, United States, Canada, uh, Ireland, um, England to a certain extent about the Irish potato famine. So understanding the pandemic is really important uh, because I know it's synchronic, it's at the present, but if you take a diachronic approach, a historical approach, these pandemics and the way we have shown that we have resilience to deal with them and the way we have shown how we can move forward is very important for us to prepare for the future. And that's something we owe to the posterity and that's something quintessentially part of what we call sustainability. And uh, but another thing is that, you know, we have so many museums. We have uh, uh, archaeological museums, anthropology museums, um, environmental museums, art museums in India. A diversity of them, some of them are mixed, which is fantastic. But in all this, you know, where, is the, where, where are the stories about climate change? Uh, the World Health Organization mapping of the pandemic and the legacies has shown that, you know, majority of the places to be hit are the big cities, centers of urbanism. And, uh, and but these, are, these centers are major uh, museums and these centers have been hit because of congestion, because of pollution, but largely and predominantly related to uh, the deterioration of climate because we did not address the cultural dimension of climate change. So look at this. I mean, with lockdowns, already the ozone layer is healing itself, which is amazing. Uh, where I live, there are so many birds. It's just unbelievable. And the air is so pure to breathe. Uh, it's good for one's health, one's lungs. And you need strong lungs to survive uh, coronavirus, right? And... Uh, so, but where are the interpretations in our museums of the impacts on climate? Uh, we celebrate and we talk about the invention of automobiles, this and that, but what about the impacts? How do we understand the impacts? Uh, we, there's so much deforestation, what are the impacts, right? And I mean, a third of the Amazonian jungles are going to be destroyed. I mean, they are the lungs of the earth. And when the lungs of the earth are destroyed, what is going to happen? So how do we understand? 
because with climate change there's no cultural borders there are no political borders if the uh, if, if the ice cap in the arctic is melting uh, right on the other side you have tuvalu and kiribati countries going under water because the water levels are rising and indian coastal line will also be impacted upon a third of vietnam in, in by 2050 will go under water at at the present rate that means the most fertile areas most populated areas of vietnam will go under water and in india i cannot tell you you know what will happen to mumbai mumbai doesn't even have to wait till 2050 it'll happen even earlier which parts of mumbai will go under water so there's severe impact so what is the role of museums in talking about environmental heritage interpreting environmental uh, heritage and uh, raising awareness about you know climate impacts and creating an understanding uh, we can't just talk about culture and forget about nature because that's not part of our culture as indians it's not part of our culture as asians it's not part of our culture as non europeans because that's that's a bi- binary that came with colonialism if you look into colonial sociology of knowledge you have culture nature nature is something to be raped and conquered and uh, culture is the civilizing force to uh, conquer the natives the, uh, the natural environment there's a whole range of legacies that we have so what i would like to do now for the remaining 10 minutes that i'm going to talk about is let's think of 10 things that we could take forward right uh, india does not have a national museum policy Uh, India is not the only country. Uh, there are many countries in the world, including Europe and uh, other parts of the world, which don't have national museum policies. But a country like India, with 1.3 billion people and uh, one of the oldest continuous cultures that you find, you know, centered around Bhimbetka, right from, you know, the Upper Paleolithic, Ashulian, to the Mesolithic. to the more recent uh, you, you know largely documented through rock art in the last 20000 years and the more do- recent the raigons who still live there uh, it, it is incredible what india has so we need a national policy uh, that actually safeguards our cultural linguistic diversity of a heritage in all its forms in all its manifestations we need to do that and uh, but it's not something that can be done ad hoc it has to be done in a consultative in a systematic and a scientific manner so i just would like to go back to the icom cultural diversity charter because that's what it was meant to be to give you 10 principles uh based on which you could discuss debate and come up with frameworks at the national or the state or local level one of the first things is cultural diversity Uh, we really need to make sure that our museums are relevant are our museums relevant i mean nearly 80% of indians live in villages and uh, most indian museums cater to the urban elites urban people middle class populations so do our museums really carry the first voice of the people who live in villages of india that is the majority of indians i think that's a fundamental question we got to start with and when we talk about diversity we got to deal with both biological and cultural diversity uh, climate change and the whole range of issues we got to deal with uh, uh, a range of cultural borders race ethnicity color in india very very color conscious caste economic status gender sexual orientation uh regional economic situations age you name it there there's a whole range of cultural borders that intersect india has produced some of the best sociologists not only in india i'm thinking of my mentor professor m n shrinivas who you know when he sp- came to australia i spent 3 months with him at the australian national university he always said that we should take a sociological approach if you want to really rehabilitate and decolonize indian museums and i think that one of the greatest sociologists have spoke long before we even thought about transformation and change in museums 
and uh, but don't look at London, New York, Paris. I already said that they haven't got the answers because we have a habit. It's a colonial hangover. We have a habit. Some of they've got the answers. Uh, we copy. We translate these things. It doesn't work like that, and uh, and I think that we really need to build on our own fantastic talent that we have in India, range of people, amazing people that are there. Uh, but when we talk about diversity, one of the things we must not forget, and it has to be central, is gender. Most Indian museums, to a large extent, are driven by men. So there's a male voice ever present in Indian museums. But the voice of women and girls, you know, is rarely heard. We might have we might have women educators, women curators. That's not the point. I'm not talking about tokenism. I'm not talking about token women, token troubles. I'm talking about the discourse. What is the discourse? What, what is the narrative? Is that narrative, you know, gender interrogated? Are we doing it? I mean, this is a fundamental question we've got to ask ourselves. So point number one is we need to really expand on the notion of diversity and with the range of issues in India. The second thing is participatory democracy. We love, I mean, India is the world's largest democracy. Politically, you know, we, we, you know it's, it's amazing how we're able to sustain it, we're able to continue this kind of democratic process. And uh, sure, we have challenges, every country does. You look at United States and its challenges of democracy right now. Every country has its challenges, but that's what is good about democracy is it can be contested and, and it can be interrogated. But are our museums democratic? Are we relevant? So what does participatory democracy mean? When we talk about community engagement very often, I'm not just talking about India, I'm talking about majority of countries in the world, including the West. It's always either curator, either collection keeper, you know, I, I will open up, I will allow people from diverse backgrounds to come in. So the authority is still with the museum. The authority is still that kind of patriarchy, if you will, that colonial hegemonic discourse, if you will. But there's no understanding, you know, of the kind of issues, the kind of atmosphere that the visitors bring into the museum as to how like I'll give you an example, right? And uh, uh, in Denmark, a colleague worked on this quite extensively for her PhD thesis. Uh, we'll bring her on to talk about it in the near future in, uh, in the Heritage Matters in the Inclusive Museum platform. What the research actually showed is, uh, by the way, Denmark is the only country in the world to systematically, nationally do user surveys uh, working with, you know, popular polling companies, you know, which is unbelievable how they did that. And But it's a small country, 5 million people as compared to 1.3 billion people in India. But what came out of that is, in fact, a curator might try to create an ambience around an exhibition. Uh, an educator might try to create lesson plans uh, for school children, adult education for lifelong learning. However, the participants, the people that are coming in, the visitors, they bring with them a whole range of values, whole range of questions, whole range of knowledge. So what is actually happening is uh, there's a hybridity, it's a fusion of the curatorial knowledge, uh, that embedded knowledge in collections, that educational value, uh, the interpretation that's provided through the exhibition as a me medium, uh, whether it's uh, in a museum, it's a traveling exhibition, it doesn't matter. And the people that are coming from diverse backgrounds into the museum are what they bring to the museum. So out of all of this, you know, an atmosphere is created. So more than the ambience that the curator tries to create, it's, it's the atmosphere that brings everybody together. How do we understand that atmosphere? It's really important. How do we understand that? So participatory democracy is not tokenism, it's not us using community groups and others, going off parachuting, doing a survey, coming back and saying, oh, I've consulted. 
And numbers don't mean anything, you know, in terms of consultation. It's the methodology that's very important. We need to develop methodologies. And believe me, uh, I chaired the Cross-Cultural Task Force of ICOM. I'm yet to come across methodologies for community engagement that really are accountable to the primary stakeholders. They're very rare, very rare. So we in India could innovate, could develop, could research. So research needs to be funded in museums in India if you want to do this. That's the second thing, participatory democracy. The third thing is cooperation and coordination. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to have ways of working together. Uh, if there are a number of co collecting institutions in New Delhi, for instance, or Calcutta, for instance, they got to work out not individual marketing strategies, individual curatorial strategies. They got to be collaborative because they bring different collections together. In a post-pandemic situation, the civic space itself will be redefined uh, in the way it is understood. So what, how can people collaborate you know, in rehabilitating the museums? How can institutions collaborate in sharing jobs for educators, for guides, for interpreters, for people in the informal sector that have lost their jobs, who are extremely poor? So can museums actually play an active role in poverty alleviation in India? The answer is yes. But for that, we need, we need cooperation, coordination to work together with that national policy that I talked to you about before. So that, that, that's, that we are always very ready to cooperate and collaborate with international museums. I've seen this, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in the United States, uh, where I'm involved with an exhibition right now, and in Europe, in UK, we're always learning objects internationally. But when it comes to collaboration, cooperation uh, within our own countries, I'm not saying India is alone. We're very happy to be a service person to foreign museums and their exhibitions. But we haven't really worked out how do we collaborate and work together ourselves within our own countries. And that's really important. So cooperation, coordination, community building. Uh, community building is really important because what we talked about as community in museums is, is an imagined community, if you will. Um, getting back to Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. We haven't really understood, you know, who are those groups in those communities and uh, how do we build, how do we participate in community building, especially in the post-pandemic civic spaces. And I think that that's, again, methodologically something we need to interrogate. Once again, hopefully, we will have in a year or two years' time, you know, a relevant, a reflexive, and a revealing and a very confronting national museum policy that will help us to transform our museums gradually. And uh, the next thing is innovation and inspiration. India is one of the most inspiring places in the world. Uh, it's one of the most creative places in the world. It's one of the in most innovative places in the world. Uh, a country that has given zero, uh, you know, the numerical, present day numerical system, the Arabs introduced it to Europe, so everybody calls them Arabic, Arabic numerals. You know, a country that's given it, can you imagine your computing, the digital medium in which I am talking to you? Can you imagine that, you know, without that zero? Can you imagine that? We have tremendous innovation, but unfortunately, except for a few of our educational institutions uh, that slowly transform this, like the IITs I'm thinking of, and there are many others, uh, including the one where I'm at now, Anant National University. Uh, apart from that, we've largely still got our curricula, our pedagogy, very archaic. You know, we need to transform this. We need to decolonize our curricula. We still have that colonial historiography, administrative historiography. Uh, we have all kinds of civics that are still not contemporary. So we need to decolonize in our curricula. We need to decolonize our pedagogy. So that innovation flourishes and India continues to inspire not only Indians but the rest of the world. Uh, as an Australian, this is my very strong appeal to my listeners here in India and elsewhere. And uh, 
The next thing is capacity building. Now, I must give you a little example why capacity building is so loosely used, whether it's in India or elsewhere. Uh, nobody ever used capacity building. Uh, question of, you know, capabilities, capacities came up. But in 1989, when Mandela was released from the prison, when he was interviewed, and uh, one of the, just before he was actually released, when he was interviewed, he you know, ANC was going to take over, you know, when South Africa transitioned from apartheid to democracy, you know. And, but he said, but we must have the capacity to govern. He emphasized that. The then UNESCO Director General Federico Mayer, when he met Mandela, he was so inspired by this notion of capacity building, he took it back to UNESCO and really promoted it globally, capacity building in the cultural sector as a major policy avenue. But what does capacity building mean? It's not getting a degree. It's not getting a qualification. It's not getting a, a, a diploma of masters in museum studies. It's far more than that. Uh, capacity to deliver outcomes is really critical. So the range of capabilities and capacities uh, in, that are needed for Indian museums need to be examined, researched, and uh, listed to rethink our curricula. And this is where I'm really delighted. In the last budget, there was a very important announcement made uh, about the establishment of a National Institute for Cultural Heritage and Conservation. Hallelujah, we needed this. India needed this. India needed this for a very long time. Uh, a substantial budget was allocated. Yes, in the post-pandemic one year, it might be reduced, but it's in the long term. That budget is for the long term. Transformation of capacity building institutions uh, in all the domains of uh, you know, collections. Uh, the domains include museums, galleries, libraries, archives, but also cultural spaces. So that institute is going to play a very important role. But if that institute becomes more of the same, it, we would have lost uh, an opportunity for another century, I would say. But I'm very confident yeah, it, that institution will move forward. The seventh thing that I want to mention is productive diversity. Why I'm using this is that uh, one of the concerns uh, that people have in museums around the world, and this is coming out everywhere, is that the economic impacts some countries are actually opening up too soon because they want to revitalize their economies. Uh, I don't know about this. I mean, I'm sure each country has its own intelligence research and uh, wisdom. But what we need to do is that we need, to be, we need to be very conscious that there are many things in life on which we can't put an economic value. If you play the economic fundamentalist or economic rationalist, you miss on valuing things. Our museums are based on values. They're not based on dollars and rupees because we, we transmit, we do intergenerational transmission of heritage values through our museums in India, elsewhere. So that value needs to take place. So for example, contingency valuation, choice modeling, there's a range of methodologies that are not taught to the best of my knowledge in India uh, that are experimented elsewhere in fact, I supervised a PhD student at University of Queensland on this, and it was phenomenal, the impact of people, people's realization that you can't put a dollar value on everything. You can't put a dollar value on your health. You can't put a dollar value on your well-being. You can't put a dollar value on your culture. You can't put a dollar value on things that your sense of place and identity. So how do we balance, how do we balance the economic situation with the cultural. So this is why I was involved in establishing uh, after the Johannesburg World Summit on Sustainable Development in you know, 2002, uh, at Research Knowledge Community, it's the largest in the world for sustainable development, on the four pillars, cultural sustainability, economic sustainability, um, uh, environmental sustainability, uh, and uh, social sustainability. These are the four pillars which are really critical. So we have to think of our museum sustainability 
if you want to be productive and deal with the diversity that we are talking about, that there's a value in our cultural diversity that adds to our economic indicators. It's really critical. So the four pillars, please don't forget them. And the next thing is standard setting. We need to benchmark what we are doing. Uh, there are too many things done, whether it's in India or elsewhere, without benchmarking them. So how do we know that we are progressing if we don't know how to benchmark? How do we know that we're not doing more of the same post-pandemic, you know, post-COVID situation, that we're not doing more of the same? This is where the ICOM Cultural Diversity Charter provides the 10 principles against which you can benchmark how you're making a transition uh, from the pre-pandemic, from the pandemic to the post-pandemic situation. So standard setting is very important. Of course, for us in museums, um, ICOM Code of Ethics is mandatory. It's essential because we are, we are professional people. We run professional museums based on ethical standards. The second thing is ICOM Cultural Diversity Charter uh, provides yeah, very good benchmarking. And uh, the third thing is the 2015 UNESCO recommendation on museums and collections. It's a recommendation, unlike the World Heritage Convention, which is a legal treaty, uh, this, like the HAL, Historical Urban Landscapes uh, 2011 recommendation of UNESCO, is soft law. But a soft law is much, much better in many ways because the recommendation which was recently reviewed, you can go onto the UNESCO web page and you can go to the page 2015 museum recommendation and you can look at the review that was done. I was one of the five people along with such people as Professor George Abungu and others, you know, in, in being able to work on the review of this, uh, along with Francois, who worked with us as a consultant. And uh, uh, so that provides another, another standard setting document. It's soft law, that means it would help us to develop our policies. If India wants to genuinely develop a national uh, museum policy, the 2015 recommendation. ICOM Code of Ethics and the Cultural Diversity Charter are three critical documents. So, uh, so that's uh, number eight. Number nine is sustainability and climate change. I already mentioned in the preview before I started talking about the 10 principles that climate change we know has had a huge role in the pandemic. It has in the past, it has again, and it has evidence itself in the urban clustering of our populations, polluted environments. And I think that museums have a fundamental ethical responsibility to deal with climate change, raising educational uh, value uh, of our museums in raising awareness about climate change so that uh, we, we it, it's not just about climate bay friendly because we often think in museums about environmental controls, it, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the broader world, you know, and the way it's being devastated by our unending greed, growth, 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 you know, with no limits. So you, we have to think what is the role of museums in dealing with the cultural dimension of climate change? What is the role of museums in dealing with sustainable development goals? Uh, several of the goals, you know, can be addressed and contextualized. Like for instance, you know, we have textiles in a lot of our museums, but this is our biggest weakness. You know, 80% of handwoven cloth, uh, cotton cloth in the world is made in India. The pandemic has devastated five and, uh, near more than half a million weavers. And, uh, but we always think of weaving in terms of the male, but the majority of weavers in fact, nearly 70% of weavers are women. There's a, gender, there's a gender dimension of our weaving collections that we never talk about in museums. In India, it's the same internationally to a large extent. So I think that, you know, when we talk about sustainability, sustainable SDG 5, which deals with women and girls, gender is really cross-cutting theme for all the other 17 uh, for all the other 16 SDGs, if you will. And finally, I want to talk about the medium in which we are talking. I'm very proud to, to talk about the digital domain because I'm, I'm a, f a professor at uh, uh, 
uh, one of the youngest, but also one of the most digitally savvy universities in India, Tanant National University. Uh, I am here not because I wanted another job. I didn't come to back to India for a job. I wanted to contribute from what I've learned in the world to make a difference. I've taught using a range of web platforms like WebCT, Blackboard, and a whole range of others in Australia. But here, you've got a whole university whose delivery is going to be guided, driven in the digital domain. And in a blended, post-pandemic, it'll become blended. So how are we going to deal with it? You know, we want to work across India with all the museum studies, heritage management programs. My coming back to India is not to be competitive, but to be collaborative, to work with everybody. That's why we're doing so many things in collaboration, like the National Intangible Heritage Festival, just to give you one small example. But in the digital domain, people, what they have done in the past is substantial central government budget in India has been spent on digitization. For what? What is your policy imperative for digitizing? What are you doing? So it's, you might have digitized a collection, got the digital knowledge, images, etc., etc. However, it's like the closed book. The Muslim saying that I was telling you right before. Uh, so it's, it's of no value unless you deal with access and engagement. So access, people are talking about it. That's fine. Access is easy, but engagement is different. How do you engage with inclusive pedagogy? How do you engage with inclusive learning and collaborative learning processes? How do you create between where the objects come from in the communities, where the objects are stored, or where the objects are being exhibited, where the objects are being interpreted? How do you create multiple stories in a collaborative learning environment so that the experiential learning in our museums is more rounded, more fulsome, more exciting, and more people will come to museums to enjoy them because they love the experiences. And that will bring in the economic dimension. That will bring in the dollars and rupees. That's what we'll bring in, not just putting in money you know, without a policy framework. So also one thing that we have to be very conscious in India is, um, and I'm really concerned about it, there is a UNESCO charter on digital heritage. Uh, if nobody that I've talked to so far in India, professional government, whatever, has actually heard about it. I'm really amazed. I mean, in Australia, it's uh, mandatory. In Netherlands, it's mandatory to know about it. And uh, because we are in the digital world, so much is being born in the digital domain. You take, for instance, uh, India is a uh, state party to the 2003 UNESCO Convention on Safeguarding Intangible Heritage. Uh, some, you know, India is still struggling to develop a national inventory, but people are digitizing. But what they're forgetting, as Dr. Kapila Watsain has emphasized when she was on the UNESCO Executive Board when the convention was being drafted, she emphasized, but if you document, and of course if you digitize, you're freezing it in time. That which is living heritage, intangible heritage is living heritage. It's been passed on from generation to generation. And uh, if you make an inventory, is your inventory, you know, dynamic? Are you able to update what is digital? It's the same thing, you know, like for instance, you know, when we talked about Buddhism in the old days, you know, we knew, we didn't know that much about Buddhism. We went essentially by sculptures using a Western hegemonic aesthetic to a large extent and collections. But we know a lot more about Buddhism textual to site-specific and everything. So we're able to interpret, reinterpret, you know, amazing places like Ajanta, Elora, Sanchi, you know, is, a, is an international treasure, you know, which is waiting to be reinterpreted. And uh, both guys being transformed. So the living heritage of those Buddhist monks that are coming to Bodh Gaya, what is it that they're bringing from their countries? Buddhism went out, but they're bringing it back. Uh, their own values they're bringing back. So we need to think in a very in a way to create a way when we talk about digital heritage, that digital heritage is not documenting and freezing in time that which is living. 
then it'll be criminal, will be culpable to criminality for killing off and sanctifying, authorizing once again, like the objects in museums, that which is living heritage. So these are the 10 things that I wanted to share with you, you know, diversity, both cultural and biodiversity. I wanted to share with you about the significance of participatory democracy, uh, rethinking cooperation and coordination without being competitive, uh, community building, and uh, uh, peace, community, you know, intercultural dialogue, community peace is through community building, uh, innovation and inspiration, capacity building, so we have capabilities and capacities to uh, develop leading museums for our people and for the rest of the world, productive diversity, so we understand the economic value of diversity, Sustainability and climate change, so we are within the present day world, contemporary issues, the post pandemic situation where climate change needs to be addressed, um, and the digital domain which needs to be understood better. We in India have 25% of software engineers in the world, like Korea has, produces the hardware, we have the software engineers. Globally our software engineers, whether you're talking about Denmark, whether you're talking about Australia, whether you're talking about the Silicon Valley, uh, whether you're talking about Vietnam, our software engineers, Indian software engineers are everywhere making a difference. Can we work with our software engineers to come up with more than just digitization documentation? Can we actually communicate our heritage values? Can we create those experiential things that we call experiential tourism? Uh, the tourism that's been devastated globally and in India. 83% of world heritage sites have been closed thanks to, because of the pandemic. Uh, large number of people have lost jobs and livelihood. Uh, museums provide content. Museums provide experiences. Museums provide excitement. Museums bring visitors, domestic and international. Museums have a very significant role in the rebuilding post-pandemic in India and anywhere in the world. What I'm saying is equally applicable elsewhere. Thank you for listening to me. Please share, you know, this video clip so that, you know, and give me feedback. The easiest way to get to me is a.gala, G-A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, at yahoo.com.au. That's the easiest way. My university email is also there. It's in the opening slide. So I'd lo love to hear from you. Thank you for listening to me. Take care. Be safe. We'll get there. We'll see a better tomorrow. We have a responsibility to do that. And uh, let's not forget more of the same will not do. So we have to think differently as we move forward. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.